starting off this countdown, we have the chariot. A really cool artifact found in King Tut's tomb was his chariot. The chariot was found dismantled, but they ended up reconstructing it for display. Okay, first off, how did they build that ancient thing without any blueprints? That's talent right there, because I struggle building IKEA furniture even with blueprints. Now, what makes this artifact significant is that it's theorized that the chariot might have been King Tut's cause of death. King Tut was found with a fractured lower leg, shattered pelvis, and ribs. A new analysis shows that he was crushed on one side of his body likely while on his knees. So some believe that he fell from his chariot in a horrific accident and died. If this is the case, then that thing is most certainly cursed. Number nine. And Kasinamun. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. After King Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh A shortly after. And perhaps she's buried near him currently in the Valley of the Monkeys. That's why we can't find her. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, where two 18th dynasty queens were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings, but not enough data was found from the mummies, but they do know the DNA is from the 18th Dynasty royal bloodline, so getting closer. In another tomb though, KV-63, numerous coffins were found. One had an imprint of a woman on it along with jewelry, women's clothing, but the biggest clue really was pottery fragments. Of course. We've all played Assassin's Creed. The truth is in the scenery, my friends. The name Patan was on these pottery fragments, and the only person to ever use this name was the lost queen of Enkin Cinnamon. So we're getting close, but let's maybe, you know, stop destroying other graves in the process. Let's try and find a nicer way to do it. Let's keep her as a secret, maybe. Number eight, King Ramses the Eighth. Number eight, the eighth. You know what I'm doing. The last son of Ramses III, King Ramses VIII. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII. Okay, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes, I tell ya. I had to proofread that sentence a few times when scripting this one up. This lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time, and historians are trying to understand why. He was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still out there, somewhere in the Valley of the Kings, just waiting. The thing is, with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KV-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII, but once he became king, everybody was like, eh, maybe not this guy, you know? Yeah, you're not that guy, pal. Apparently you're not that guy. Apparently you weren't that guy. There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII as well, tomb QV43 in the Valley of the Queens. Made for him, but never used. The poor souls who had to build these, my gosh. Number seven, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago a lot, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time ago with all this ancient history, but in 2014, archeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty. Yeah, it was tucked away in Luxor, Egypt all this time. Spanish archeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty. It's pretty obvious this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high ranking official because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt. Officials believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave due to the, you know, large amount of human remains found inside. That's a pretty jarring clue. It's important to note that this tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from later on in that time were also found in this tomb. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools for Gogurt. Number six, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings, like all the great ones here. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. For starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, what? Tomb KV50 and KV51 and this one as well, all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these tombs were found. So when we enter a tomb normally that's been untouched, ideally for thousands of years, we can find anything. In fact, whatever they do find, it's a win, I guess. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials open KV-52 and it was completely empty, that doesn't feel too nice. That's not very warming. It was empty except for two boxes, both black and undecorated. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey and the smaller one was a chest and it had four compartments. Yeah, hauntingly bare compared to what else we have on this list coming up. Number five. KV-55. Okay, we covered KV-50, 52, they're all one tomb, but they're not. They're separate tombs. What's going on here? This one was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb. And the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because, well, we don't know who it was made for, really. The classic, ah, oh, what happened, you know? Even the walls of the tomb inside, they're empty. They aren't covered with any hieroglyphs. There's no artwork. There isn't any clothing laying around, no jewelry. It's quite odd. It's just simply bare. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV-55, you'll notice only a few markings on the entrance. Markings that show that the 
entrance was once widened since it was first cut, along with its ceiling being raised slightly higher. So adjustments were made at some point. This wasn't a forgotten project by any means. The only hint as to who or what is buried here is remains on the walls. One hieroglyph was found in 1907. One hieroglyph, that's it. And it translates to, the evil one shall not live again. Okay, so we should leave this alone, right? Yeah, you agree? Hit that thumbs up if you agree. I feel like we agree. Number four, Ankhmahor Curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods. One warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. That's that's a pretty good warning. I don't know. If I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers' necks will be wrung out like a goose, I'd turn around. You got me. You don't need a be beware of dog sign. We're all set with that. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across. Just don't break into people's stuff. Don't steal stuff. Inside the found tomb of Ankhmahor, a pharaoh official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written on the walls. It was buried in Mastaba. It was an above ground massive tomb and this warning was the first thing you saw. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of Ankhmahor's knowledge of secret spells and magic. And it threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts. Again, there's that or beware of dog. You can pick which one you want to put in front of your building. What's more impactful for your property? It's you decide. Number three. 2020 tombs. 2020, okay, while most of the world was stuck inside watching documentaries, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, this time they were occupied. Yeah, gross. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archaeologists have never been more excited, which is a weird thing to say after what I just said. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy, I guess? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind-blowing. It's actually pretty awesome. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long, that's good. This is great. I'm glad we found it instead of, you know, pirates. The findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations, like Persians or Greeks. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we really need to open them up? Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly? Like, what is he? It's gonna be bones. It's gonna be goop. Like, we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process. It's kind of, it's kind of ironic. I don't know. Number two, black tomb. We found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria back in 2018. I remember this trending because I made several Brendan Fraser jokes on Twitter. Yeah, a lot of mummy talk happening that weekend. Things got real when the cousin of antiquities minister opened it up. Yeah, we just opened up a mysterious black granite tomb just because we're curious cats. When archaeologists found this massive untouched tomb, untouched for over 2,000 years, might I add. On one hand, that's a feat in itself, historical, great, discovery, awesome. But us humans, we have to just open it up and take a peek and just smell whatever's inside. Let's just do that, I guess. Maybe it's Alexander the Great, who knows? Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at the construction site fled the scene. They straight up ran away, it smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, the guy put his entire head in the tomb to make sure that it's safe. I mean, or you could just do this with your hand. That works. Why your head? Like, just do one of these. I mean, I get it. The guy's OG. Nothing ended up happening, I think. I don't know. Number one, King Tut. One of the greatest mysteries is, of course, the history of the young King Tut. Really young younger than you might think. The young boy became pharaoh at age nine in 1332 BC. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. It wasn't exactly a, a chill time. At this point, Egypt and Nubia were going head to head over land. And not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh died at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was seen again. Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately, as you would have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, historically. When King Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that was coating the coffin after this long. But in doing so, they damaged him. They were too rough. They were too excited with this, you know, old ass dude. So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age. Yeah, we kind of blew it. We have some ideas though. It's not entirely hopeless. It's believed that King Tut had a broken leg. After some 3D scans were done, it appears the king may have not been in the best shape prior. He may have fallen off a chariot and then simply just cracked his leg and that's how he died. So if Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, who was that tomb he was buried in really meant for? Some suggest the tomb was built for the lost queen, Queen Nefertiti, but again, still trying to figure this one out because we haven't found her yet. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. Tut passed away at 19, so many believe his own burial chamber wasn't even done being built yet, so they just threw him in hers. How rude is that? History is pretty rude. I don't 
don't know. If I can sum up history, I'd say it's rude. Yeah, that's a fair word. We still haven't found her final resting place, but with the aid of technology and 3D scans, I have a feeling we're getting pretty close. Coming in at number 10, we have the Cursed Workers Tomb of Giza. The 4,500 year old tomb has just been reopened near the Great Pyramid of Giza. The mass burial site in the tribal mountains was closed for nearly 30 years in order to protect it from thieves. The Giza Plateau tomb is thought to be cursed and contains the remains of high profile workers. These basically weren't slaves, they were high profile and included the ancient royal palace supervisor Nefertith. He is buried there with his two wives and his 18 children. He was busy. The tomb contains two fake doors, so clearly people weren't supposed to get in. Inscribed on the wall was the following curse warning. All people who enter this tomb who will make evil against this tomb and destroy it, may the crocodile be against them in the water and the snakes against them on the land. May the hippopotamus be against them in the water and the scorpions against them on the land. The tomb was reopened for the public recently in order to boost tourism in the area, but with that kind of warning, I'm not sure if I fancy a visit. Moving on at number 9, we have the meat mummy container. So apparently mummies get hungry on the way to the afterlife. As a result, they are often buried with food. The food is carefully preserved so that they can last a long time for their lengthy journey. This is done by preparing the meat for eating, then wrapping the meat in linen. So they basically mummify the meat. In King Tut's tomb, they found 48 containers of meat mummies. Guess King Tut is a big eater. Good thing that we took away his source of food from him. Like, come on guys, you're making the curse worse than it is. This dude's gonna be mad. I mean, I would be if people took away food from me. We all know how sacred food is. In our eighth spot, we have the toe and finger caps. This is one of the more odd items found in King Tut's tomb. So King Tut was found with gold toe caps on his feet and fingers. That's right just little golden covers for each individual toe and finger. These were placed on the divine after death so that their toes and fingers keep their shape. These were placed onto his body during mummification. It's also thought to protect the dead from magical dangers. Now, I'm hoping that they didn't remove these little caps from his body, but chances are they probably did. So if anything happens to his digits, boy, he's gonna be mad. Coming in at number 7, we have the woven gloves. Experts believe that this next piece is one of the few items that was actually used by King Tut while he was alive. International Egyptologist Tarek El Awadi said, and I quote, Most of the objects found in the tomb are ceremonial or designed to be used by the pharaoh in the afterlife. But he believes that these gloves were probably worn by King Tut, either during the winter time or when he was riding his royal chariot. That's pretty cool. I mean, the gloves don't look too stylish, but I think all of these ancient artifacts are so amazing. Moving on to number 6, we have the Canopic Jars. As part of their burial process, Egyptians would place the internal organs of the dead into four jars before mummification. One jar had King Tut's lungs, another had his stomach, another had his intestines, and one was for his liver. And apparently I say intestines wrong. That's how it is in Canada. Sorry. <laughs> the jars were found inside of an alabaster chest. It was thought that King Tut needed these organs in the afterlife, which is why they were preserved. Preserved. Not only that, but four goddesses protected them. But now these jars have been moved to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, but his body is still in its original resting place. Great. So King Tut's body and his internal organs are kept separate. Bet he loves that. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the walking sticks. Among the countless artifacts Tut was buried with, a more interesting one would be his walking sticks. But he wasn't just buried with one walking stick. No, he was buried with 130 walking sticks. Why he needed that many is beyond me. So what we do know is that King Tut had a deformed left leg. People theorize that he had a rare bone disorder called Kohler's disease, and that's what caused this deformity. So it may just be that he needed a walking stick to get around. In fact, in tons of depictions, he was drawn with this walking stick. Some think that it was just a royal staff. But with the newfound evidence of his foot, it's more likely that he needed them for mobility. And chances are, they're cursed. And they have been separated from King Tut's body, meaning he's stuck in the afterlife 
probably hobbling around since we took away his sticks. Like come on people, stop angering the king. Coming in at number 4 we have Anubis. Guarding the entrance of King Tut's tomb was a statue of a black jackal on top of a podium. This jackal is known as Anubis, the god of the afterlife. Anubis is said to protect the dead, guarding their spirits from trespassers. The jackal was 3 feet long, made of wood and plaster. This was then painted black, which is the symbolic color of Anubis. Black was chosen since it represents death and decay, but it also symbolizes the fertile soil of the Nile and regeneration. It's crazy how much detail was put into these things. So Anubis was placed outside of King Tut's tomb as kind of a no trespassing sign. But we trespassed, so now it's cursed. I mean, it's said that Anubis punishes the mortals who ignore its warning and disturb the dead. In our third spot, we have Tut's Burial Mask. Tut's Burial Mask, otherwise known as a Death Mask, was found in King Tut's coffin resting directly on the shoulders of his mummy. Okay, with a name like Death Mask, gotta be cursed. So these masks were made to resemble the person that it was placed on. It was done so that the spirits could recognize the body after death and help them to the underworld. The mask was filled with oils which helped with the mummification process. Not only that, but at the back of the mask there was a protective spell inscribed into it. The spell was to protect Tut's limbs as he travels to the underworld. Now, according to rumors, Tut's beard on the mask was accidentally snapped off and then glued back on. So not only did they remove a protective mask from King Tut, but they broke it too. Yeah, King Tut is probably really upset about that. Let's hope this didn't interfere with him getting into the underworld. Coming in at number two, we have King Tut. So obviously one of the biggest discoveries in King Tut's tomb was King Tut himself. He was buried in a coffin, placed inside another coffin, inside another coffin, inside another coffin. There were 8 coffins in total. So like I mentioned before, anyone that handles King Tut's body or his artifacts are said to be cursed. After Tut's body was found, he was sent to a radiologist to get x-rayed. The radiologist's name was Sir Archibald Douglas Reed. The next day, after conducting the x-ray, Reed fell sick. He died three days later. His death is blamed on King Tut's curse. And in our number one spot, we have the Cobra Staff. So this is where it gets interesting. Rumor has it that the reason why several men mysteriously died after the expedition was because one of the workers stole King Tut's Cobra Staff. Howard Carter claimed that when they found the tomb, it was already robbed. But he may have said that to cover up the fact that him and his team took a couple of artifacts as souvenirs, particularly the Cobra Staff. Ironically enough, one of Carter's team members, James Henry Breasted, returned home to find his pet canary eaten by a cobra, and the cobra was still occupying the cage. Hmm. A cobra staff goes missing, and a cobra is found in his home. Coincidence? I think not. Kicking off the list at number 10. EA6736. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. At one point or another you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, but they also worshipped other animals as well. It's not just cats, okay? So if you're sitting there looking at Mr. Freckles or whatever, don't give him too much praise, okay? There's other worshipped animals to talk about, like baboons. Believe it or not, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons, but the most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collections of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display and it looks a little different than the rest. EA6736 was recovered from the Temple of Khans in Luxor, Egypt. This little man here dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC to 10 BC. So yeah, he's he's a little old. He looks great for his age though, I mean really. Baboons would appear all over art and religion in ancient Egypt. One of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egypt, pharaohs would train baboons to make arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start chasing you, doing parkour, jumping over houses. It's crazy. Baboons are so smart, no wonder they worship them, honestly. Coming in at number 9, we have the curse of Amenhotep. Curses aren't supposed to be funny, I get that, but I can't help but thinking that the Egyptians went a little overboard when inscribing the curse in the son of Hapo, Amenhotep's tomb. Let's have a little read, shall we? He who enters this tomb will lose their earthly possessions and honours, be incinerated in a furnace in excretion rites, capsize and drown at sea, have no successors, receive no tomb or funerary offerings 
organs of their own, and their bodies would decay because they will starve without sustenance, and their bones will perish. Cool, basically all of the bases are pretty much covered then. While his tumour was broken into, his sarcophagus hasn't actually been opened yet as it has a very well preserved face mask, probably best to keep it that way. Coming in at number 8 we have the black tomb of Osiris. Am I here for an eerie black tomb? No, no I'm not. Am I here for an eerie black tomb belonging to the Egyptian god of the dead? Again. Really, I'm gonna have to pass on opening that one up. In 2015, a 25th dynasty structure was unearthed near Luxor on the west bank of the River Nile. So Osiris was a mythological god of the dead, but it seems that the Egyptians made a tomb for him anyway. All ancient Egyptian burial chambers were associated with Osiris, as pharaohs and rich Egyptians wanted to be able to share the afterlife with him. If Osiris decorates normal tombs, who decorates his? Demons holding knives. That's who. Can't be good. The tomb was opened in 2015, a year still fraught with violent protests in the country. I don't know about you, but I think it could have been a bad idea to open the God of the Dead's tomb. Just a hunch. Coming in at number 7, we have Tombs with the Donkey Curse. You may not have learned this particularly gnarly piece of information at school when you were studying the ancient Egyptians, but a lot of 21st dynasty curses used to protect their wills, property, and tombs in Egypt, and they were subject to a curse from the god Seth. Now, Seth was a god of storms, violence, and deserts. He also happened to be a donkey. Anyway, curses involving Seth specifically said that he would rape those who entered the tombs. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to mess with a curse that promised a donkey would. well. You know. A donkey curse was famously found in the tomb of Deir el Bari Graffito, but we don't know if it actually, you know, ever came to fruition because who would admit to that? Coming into number six, we have Mummy Soup. Very recently, in July 2018, a mystery tomb was opened in the Alexandria region. In it, archaeologists found a black granite sarcophagus dating back 2,000 years. As they began to lift the lid, a pungent smell stopped them in their tracks. Later, with masks and the Egyptian army in tow, the lid was lifted to reveal decomposed bodies. The family inside were buried, but their mummified remains had been exposed to the elements, and they were found as just bones in a pool of water. Water which Presumably, their bodies are dissolved in over time. Ugh. So far, so good on the curse front, but these things seem to take a little time to manifest. Nonetheless, for me, the decomposed body water would have been enough to fill my nightmares forever. Did the mummy of Amun Ra cause the Titanic to sink at number five? A mysterious mummy thought to belong to the princess of Amun Ra was dug up in a vault in Luxor in the late 1800s, or so the story goes. Four Englishmen were said to have drawn lots to buy the mummy in the 1890s, with one paying several thousand pounds sterling to take the mummy. It seems that this this man walked out into the desert later that day and never returned. Another of the men was shot, having to have his arm amputated. Another lost all his money and another suffered a severe illness. Nonetheless, the coffin eventually reached England where it caused all kinds of drama. It was eventually gifted to the British Museum where it was later put up for sale for further chaos. Basically, the British Museum didn't want any of it, it was bringing bad luck to the building. The legend has it that the mummy was sold to a wealthy American and packed into the cargo hold of the RMS Titanic and well, we all know what happened there. A lot of people dismiss this as pure myth as there was no evidence of a mummy in the cargo hold of the ship, but honestly, who knows. Coming into number 4 we have the Cosmic Void. The Heritage Innovation Preservation Project has been working with Cairo University and the Egyptian government to scan yes scan the Great Pyramids in Giza. In 2017, a pyramid housing the tomb of the great pharaoh Khufufu showed a mysterious and spooky void when it was scanned. Built in 2560 BC, this weird void has been locked away and kept a secret for over 4,000 years. By scanning the pyramid with cosmic rays, the team behind the research estimate that the void is 98 feet long and 50 feet high, which is pretty big. What even is this void? Is it a black hole? Is it a curse? It seems to be just kind of nothingness, which in itself is pretty creepy to me. Some archaeologists are calling it an intentional design element, but what is it? It seems this void is completely sealed off from any known passageways inside the pyramid. There's no way to get at it, so how was it even built? So far, the Scan Pyramid team haven't ventured into the void yet, which honestly, I think is for the best. Who knows what kind of plague could be unearthed? Coming into number three, we have the Catacombs Curse at Tuna Egebel. Home to the tomb of Petasiris and Isadora, the Tuna El Gebel 
Double Acropolis was excavated by archaeologist Sammy Gabra in the 1940s. Those who worked on the excavations in the area reported spells of dizziness, headaches, shortnesses of breath, and even in some cases, seizures. At the time, the team thought that they had angered the ibis headed god Toth by disturbing the ancient curse. In reality, it was discovered that the tomb contained a lot of noxious gas, which probably explains the sickness. Either way, some would say they probably should have left the tomb well alone. Coming in at number two, we have the two cursed mummies of Alexandria. In 1699, it was claimed by author Louis Pencher that a Polish man had purchased two mummies excavated from tombs in Alexandria. It seems the man wanted to study them for medicinal purposes, which actually was very common back in that era. Often people would resort to robbing graves so they could have bodies to study. Anyway, the mummies were taken on board a ship from Egypt to Poland on a voyage across the Mediterranean Sea. Unfortunately, removing the mummies from their tomb was a terrible idea. The man and his crew started to have violent and horrific nightmares, saying they were haunted by two ghosts. They soon realized the ghosts haunting them were the spirits of the mummies. They tossed them overboard, and as soon as the corpses were submerged in the sea, the vision stopped. Okay, finally, this was a mistake. A very, very, very big mistake. On February the 16th, 1923, the last chamber of King Tutankhamun's tomb was opened, and a whole can of cursed worms came out. This is all coming in to number one. King Tut died when he was just a teenager in around 1400 BC. Fast forward 2,500 years, and archaeologist Howard Carter entered his sealed burial chamber and began the rumors of the Egyptian curse. The tomb was excavated and entered between November 1922 and February 1923. The tomb was, like almost all Egyptian tombs, inscribed with a curse, and this one seemed particularly potent. On the day Carter entered the tomb, a cobra got into his pet canary's cage with the bird dead in its mouth. Now, the cobra is the symbol of the Egyptian monarchy, and the symbolism wasn't lost on locals who began to panic. Lord Carnarvon, the financial backer of the excavation project, died shortly after the tomb was first breached as a result of an infected mosquito bite. The bite possibly matched a healed legion found on King Toot's cheek during his autopsy. Furthermore, two of Carnarvon's half brothers died shortly after excavation. One of the doctors who worked on King Toot's body, radiologist Sir Archibald Douglas Reed, also died a year later, as did two other members of the excavation team, all within a few years of the tomb's opening. Mm -hmm. 